Hello. 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 Hello? 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 Hi, this is Danny. Good morning. Good morning, Regent Mayron. We are we do hear you and you're connected to okay. the Regents Wonderful. meeting. All right, thank you. I'm gonna go on mute and Yeah, if you we'll can mute yourself until uh, you'll hear us start in just a moment. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. I sued the university. That's the number center. That's in me. Good morning.
morning. There we Good go. Good morning. All right, we got uh, plenty to do today, so I think uh, we're, we're short a member yet, but uh, um, well, we're short our president yet, aren't we? We can get started on the uh, the first item of business, though, and then we'll uh, hold is there's Chancellor Black. Okay, so as you've uh, seen here, we have quite a few items of business before us. At the tail end of the uh, of the agenda, this is of course I should have introduced as the Finance and Operations Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents meeting today, and I'll gavel the committee to order. Uh, we have at the tail end of this uh, this committee meeting, if we have time, the opportunity to uh, ask our senior vice president to uh, update us on uh, some budget, um, you know, underpinnings and uh, and assumptions that uh, we're not here to make any budget decisions, certainly, but uh, that that's going to be time dependent on what kind of time we spend on the the uh, business items before us. So the first of those is a resolution related to sale, the sale of uh, the KUMD radio station to the Duluth Superior Area Television Corporation. And I just want to take a moment to recognize Patty if she's here. There she is in back. Thank you. The CEO of, uh, of the uh, Duluth Superior Area Educational Television Corporation. Thank you for your partnership in, uh, in bringing this to uh, the point it's at. So we discussed this last month. If there's a, a motion to approve it, I'd entertain that. Is there a second? Sure. All right. Any discussion? Further discussion on this matter? Regent Shu. Chair McMillan. Uh, I don't know if I'm talking close enough. Uh, last, so I wasn't present for that, but I was on the phone, and I think I did ask a question um, about whether or not the uh, letters KUMD were going to be used going forward, and I don't think I got an answer, at least I didn't hear it. Chancellor Black, do you want to tackle that? I'm not sure I'm, I'm capable of answering that, or if you are either, so. Good morning, Chair McMillan, members of the board, and Regent Shu. I believe, I, I thought I had answered that, but if I hadn't, I'd be happy to answer again. The, the real answer is I don't know for sure at this point. Uh, the, um, those decisions will be up to the new owners of the station. Uh, we have had substantive discussions uh, regarding the, uh, the fact that the uh, station will uh, be making it clear that they're broadcasting from the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth, and we'll look for other ways to keep the, the Duluth and UMD's uh, presence and visibility there with the new station. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know for sure what might happen to the call letters. Regent Chu, uh, is there any way we can get a better answer today? Chancellor Black, it's not in the, the it's, contract, right? It's not right? part there's of the no, contract, yeah. and, and it's not really my decision, so there's no way for me to give you, give you that answer. Um, my answer would be that'll be up to the buyer. But. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I'm just a little bit concerned because that is, you know, those are our letters. KUMD actually refers to the fact that it was a student-run radio station for many years, and if they continue to broadcast with KUMD, then well, that's you know, a different question than who owns the legal right to the name. Not right, whether. but there could be confusion, uh, and we don't know what the format's going to be ongoing uh, if they're going to continue to use the K KUMD letters. Well, we can ask someone with legal knowledge of uh, what the contract says, but I don't believe it's addressed in the contract in terms of whether they'll use it or not. But I assume when the buyer buys the station, they're also buying the name, and uh, that will move from our control of use to their control of use. But again, I'm not the lawyer on the deal, and uh, if I misstated that, then we should have uh, 
our general counsel come to the table or let uh, Chancellor Black reiterate. I've got two other regents that want to visit as well, uh, or at least Regent Rocha. Regent Anderson def de declined. Uh, no, oh. I, I, uh, I think you answered my question, Dave. I was, I was going to probably point to Regent Chu that unless it's explicit in the contract, you know, the new owner would have the ability right. to uh, petition the FCC for, for new call letters, I would, I would think. Um, and I'm not so sure we could even guarantee it in a contract that they that the FCC wouldn't just assign new call letters. So, quite, I don't know if there's anything we can do about it. Quite frankly, Regent right. Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, on that point, um, yeah, I, I can imagine. You know, there are. Um, I'm trying to think of it, and this is not an area of expertise uh, for me at all, but. When you think about a station that would be part of a larger conglomerate of stations, whether it's like a, a Jack FM or an NPR, NPR, you can imagine that if they were to sell off a small station, that I'm not sure how that works. If they've got call letters underneath or whatever, Mike, and you know the the, the thought about this and and, and having um, sort of tried to review the impact of this and and going forward in thinking that well, you know. Uh, the terrestrial radio of this variety is it, you know, it's, it, it's still a popular but but not, not you know it's not a novel technology and I'm just thinking that from the standpoint of um, if if we find that we can produce the same <clears throat> sort of function the upsides of this but not necessarily have to have a radio station to do it whether it's through internet you know means or podcasts or otherwise having the KUMD moniker would be very valuable um, that, that we would still have the right to, to possess that and so I think there'd be value in, in you know, before pulling the trigger on the contract to, to see what we can do where there's at least a, an assurance that we would have the, the, um, the, the trademark, so to speak, to continue to use that. Because even though you might go to a different form of the technology, they may, you, know, you might hold on to your, your call letters starting with K's and W's depending on which side of the river you're on and all that. But um, that would be a loss for us, I think, if we didn't have that in the future to be able to access that. And if it's all the same, I, I don't, I wouldn't anticipate they're planning to use the same call letters, but I, I don't know the answer. Um, the, the question that I would have for Chancellor Black is, um, you know, I know that uh, there, one of the advantages of, of coming to campus for uh, these meetings is you get to talk about things. This is one that's, you know, pretty relevant to, to Duluth. And a lot of people, I think, have had good experiences working on college stations at, at our various campuses and campuses across the country. Will there be opportunities like that? Um, is there a commitment that our, that our students will have the opportunity to be serving the university community as well as um, getting that experience with the new buyer? Chancellor Black. Yes, uh, Chair McMillan and, and Regent Rocha, uh, it, it is stated, I believe, in the docu materials that uh, the, the new owners have uh, expressed interest and made a commitment to have many opportunities for students. In fact, I anticipate there'll be even more opportunities for students than they have been currently, uh, especially because students will be able to work in a mixed media environment with both television and radio, uh, which we don't, we, don't have a, we don't have a television station uh, here at UMD. We don't have a broadcasting major as such, but we do have a number of students who are interested in the area. So um, we uh, have had extensive conversations about ongoing internship possibilities, also uh, research possibilities uh, with students and, and faculty members. Uh, so there's, there's much ongoing activity for our students and faculty embedded uh, in, in this new partnership. Sure, just follow up. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you. I, I know there was reference to it. I, I, I think there's some ambiguity on, on campus as to what it's going to look like or, you know, it's a, because it's not a firm commitment or not a contracted commitment to do it. And so um, I would just say that, you know, my, my intent in, in supporting the proposal is that that will be pursued, um, in, you know, earnestly. Um, and then also I would, um, uh, I would support the proposal w with the assurance that we're going to seek uh, the capacity to hold on to the call letters. If, if, you know, I know we don't have it in the contract in front of us, but I do think there's value there. Thank you. Before I call on uh, Regent Kenyanya, um, we do have the letter of intent in our materials if, if that's attached to it and has been since. Uh, so this is a letter of intent. This is a question, um, Chancellor Black, which will be followed if approved by the board today, will be followed by the negotiation of definitive sale agreements, I assume. Or is, uh, this, is this it? 
Well, this is this is the first step yes. in, yeah. in the process. So there'll be a more extensive agreement yep. that will be negotiated, um, a purchasing agreement, and then we will go through a due diligence process. Uh, we will um, also make application to the FCC um, for this. Uh, we, we already have a leg up on those uh, activities. Uh, they're they're uh, uh, they're ready to begin. Is assuming you all approve this today. Um, and Greg Brown, who uh, sat with me back in February, is taking the lead on this uh, with the OGC office, and he's also working with FCC attorneys as well. Uh, so I, um, I'm, I'm confident that those uh, processes will move forward right away. Good, and that's a standard way to approve and move beyond a letter of intent, which I remind the board is what's before us today, the letter of intent and in your materials. I see General Counsel Peterson has joined us. Do you have uh, clar clarity to bring to the, the, the situation? Chair McMillan, thank you. Um, no, not the clarity that the board seeks, but I have been communicating with a lawyer who is conversant on the transaction documents, um, and this is an issue that is not addressed in the LOI as it's currently framed up. Um, what ability we have, given the negotiating landscape, in order to address some of these points in a way that would be most be beneficial to the university, um, I don't know. Um, so. Um, I think that's the state of affairs today um, as to the situation. Good. All right. Thank you. Regent Kenyanya. Where are There you are. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my comments were just, I mean, Regent Rocha uh, kind of hinted at them, just to reiterate the, des the strong desire to, um, to see continued and increased and enhanced student involvement. Um, with the with the new owners, um, you know what happens on the back end and, and the contractual stuff is one thing, but to what extent that student involvement and, and uh, really students being at the heart of KUMD um, can continue and be enhanced, as the chair alluded to, with the or I think the chancellor alluded to, with the opportunity for the mixed media, um, love to see that continue, and that's I think that's the main feedback I've gotten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Other input. Questions, comments. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, call for a vote on uh, the those in favor of approving the LOI. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. So, uh, Regent Mayeron, I should have noted your participation by phone. I believe you voted in the affirmative. I did. Thank you. All right. That motion carries, and uh, we. Move on now to a series of real estate transactions. And the first of those is going to be introduced by President Gable and then uh, further covered by our Assistant Vice President Krieger is the sale of the Murphy Warehouse. And I won't recite the address there, but uh, it's in your materials. And to begin our conversation, recall in October, we spent something approaching 45 minutes discussing this, and I just note that, that we have had discussion about it. It was then postponed by the board and uh, is back before us today for, uh, for review, further, further review if needed by the board and, uh, and action. So to bring that matter before us, I'd seek a motion to recommend approval of the sale of the uh, Murphy Warehouse on the Twin Cities can near the Minneapolis campus. Is there such a motion? Is there a second? Second. Very good. It's been moved and seconded. And uh, I'd now open it up to the board for a uh, discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. I went right past our president, who was going to introduce the topic to us. So sorry, President Gable. I was so anxious to get to the discussion, I was going to bypass you. I'm I accept your apology, Chair Powell. <laughs> Good morning, members of the board, Vice Chair Swiggum. Uh, the university's physical footprint and the fiscal stewardship around our capital investments are obviously a very critical decision that we make with much thought, deliberation, and seriousness, and something that, of course, I personally also give much thought and deliberation to. 
Um, at the same time, we're also committed in the broad sense to being effective stewards of scarce resources and making sometimes difficult choices on where to invest our limited funds. And in this spirit before you today is the decision or potential decision to authorize the sale of the what we've come to call the Murphy Warehouse. Guiding this process to date was the university administrative policy, which is called acquiring and disposing of university real estate and related procedure real estate transactions. That policy as it stands today states that disposal may occur when it is determined that the real estate is no longer needed now or in the future to fulfill the university's mission and is designated as surplus. It provides guidance regarding the process to dispose of real estate and it's based on the statutory process for state-owned properties which we follow. So as you know, we're also working on our um, system-wide strategic plan, which addresses land, land holding, and would presumably address in some um, capacity what we have before us today. And it would be better if that were done. That would be helpful if it were done. But as you may recall, when we started the strategic planning process, we noted in open meeting that we couldn't hold the business of the university up while we were doing strategic planning. And some things would come along, opportunities and challenges, that we would need to address in real time during the strategic planning process as best we could. And I would consider this one of those moments. Um, I will also note that the process for selling um, the Murphy Warehouse or considering the sale of Murphy Warehouse began back in February of 2019, long before we began the strategic planning process. Um, the Board of Regents received a notice of declaration of surplus property via a February 19, 2019 memo from Vice President Berthelsen, and the property was offered for sale to the state of Minnesota and local governments then in March of 2019. The Board received a notice of issuance of an RFP in May of 2019 via a memo also from Mike Bertelsen, um, which referred back to the February memo, and the RFP was issued in May of 2019. The board reviewed the proposed transaction in September and October 2019, as um, uh, Chair McMillan, sorry, uh, indicated. Apologies for my earlier slip. Um, and as noted by this timeline, uh, you know, I was not president at the time all of this happened, and the first discussions happened very early in my tenure. Um, so it was uh, challenging for me personally to have context around which to make my own decision about whether or not this was something that um, I would add to the previous administration's recommendation to the board. But what I see today, after many months and external review um, and my own um, increased education around where we're going and what we hope to do, are a number of reasons why uh, the university would propose that the board consider this sale. So first, um, via the discussion that the board had and multiple memo exchanges, we know that the property requires significant capital investment. We know that holding the property is very expensive. We have subject matter experts here who can go into detail on that, but I will just list that as a uh, top line bullet point. Um, second, when the university acquired the property, it was for a purpose that um, has turned out not to be viable uh, for the same expense reasons. Um, and in, a in terms of physical location, it is not the direction in which we find ourselves going and in which we're making significant capital investment to go. Um, and uh, ultimately, um, the work required in terms of cost to hold purpose and physical location as a combination would make us interested in considering selling it. And then we receive an offer to sell it at a price where we would earn a profit at the end of the day. And so for those reasons, um, subject to the more detailed conversation that you'll have uh, momentarily, it is my recommendation that the board consider this property for sale. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, President Gable. And uh AVP Krieger, I think uh, I was I was anxious there. I was going to bypass both of you two, and I didn't mean to do that. I know you have a uh, a set of slides, and uh, the purpose being to uh, properly context this and its current status for the board. So why don't we proceed? And then, uh, since we've already got a motion in front of us, we can jump right into uh, discussion after you finish. Members, can everybody hear me? Uh, first of all, thank you for holding a special meeting of the facility. This morning to attend to these recent it's on track in terms of our time frame. It's particularly Just wanted to give you all a chance to see Duluth. So that <laughs> any chance we get. <laughs> uh, 
So for just, again, for orientation, we are talking about the property located uh, at south of Elm Street and west of 24th Avenue Southeast, comprising 21.76 acres across the railroad tracks and rail yards from the east. As, uh, as you know, the university acquired the property in December of 2015 from Lincoln Warehouse Company for $17.975 million. The property includes 38 interconnected building sections, totaling 706,000 square feet, constructed between 1902 and 1977. At close, the University and the Murphy Warehouse Company entered into a 10-year leaseback, initially covering 60, 663,000 square feet of building space. The site continues to serve as the headquarters for the Murphy Warehouse Company, and the co company currently leases 394,700 square feet. The site also houses the University Bookstore Warehouse operations and some departmental storage. There are plans to add an additional 14,000 square feet of university storage if an NSF uh, grant award comes through to LACOR to expand their core sample repository. The older brick buildings at that front Elm Street are now vacant. I won't go into detail on this slide because President Gable did such a good job of uh, articulating the strategic reasons, but in any case, in every case where we uh, do a real estate transaction, either the disposal or the acquisition, we ask the question of what is the strategic value to the university? And as I noted, President Gable articulated those quite well. I would add, related to some of the uh, carrying costs and land banking, there were a number of questions that came in from Regent Rocha last night. I, I'm not looking at the stock market on my phone. I'm just referencing those questions, so uh, I apologize. Um, uh, one of them was a question related to the repairs over $1.5 million that were identified uh, that we have done to date. And that gets into the question related to the significant investments in building systems. I don't have, uh, and again, I apologize, I, I get car sick when I, uh, in, so I can't read in the car, but uh, so I couldn't pull those, the details up this morning on the drive up. But I, uh, from memory, the, we have done emergency roof repairs. The biggest cost was related to some of the most urgent fire code issues related to emergency egress and lighting. Those were things that we could not hold off doing, uh, unlike the sprinkler repairs, which are slated for um, urgent but not emergency. Uh, the other ones, uh, we also repaved the parking lot that was uh, crumbling, and then there's some other uh, associated uh, just shoring and day-to-day uh, -day, uh, repairs that exceed the $1,500 uh, requirement in the lease. transaction. Uh, in February 2019, the university, as uh, President Gable noted, began the process of disposing of the property. The property, the purchase sale price that was negotiated following the selection of Ryan companies through the RFP process is $22 million, including $250,000 of earnest money. The university is not required as part of this purchase agreement to make any of the immediate, need, re, immediate repairs uh, prior to sale. The buyer is to assume the existing lease with Murphy Warehouse Company, and the sale is conditioned upon the buyer and the university executing a new lease for the university to occupy, occupy space in the facility. It's been the university's choice to delay final negotiations of the lease until we receive notice of whether the NSF grant has been awarded, given the 14,000 square feet that that would entail. Regardless, Ryan Companies has committed to a gross, gross lease rate of $7.50 per square foot to accommodate current lease uses, as well as the potential LACOR grant. Ryan is also com committed to an initial six-year term and then multiple five-year options for renewal. These renewal options will provide the university a long-term solution for our storage needs at market rate, but also provides the university the flexibility it needs as business, as business needs change in the bookstore operations and the flexibility it needs in case the NFS, NSF grant uh, um, does not come through or at some point in the future NSF decides not to renew the proposed grant on a five-year cycle. The due diligence will be 180 days with closing to occur the first business after the exp expiration of the due diligence period. 
We have not finalized the purchase agreement. Uh, when, um, after the September Board of Regents meeting, buying companies decided to put a hold on the final uh, exchange of red lines related to the purchase agreement until they had an understanding whether or not the board would act uh, in favor of the sale. So we've been on hold since September related to the final negotiations, the purchase agreement, but have received commitments from Ryan related to the $7.50 per square feet for the gross lease. And with that, I turn it over to questions for questions, and um, hopefully I can answer some of these other ones that came in last night as part of the question and answer. All right, thank you, Assistant VP Krieger. Um, I would remind uh, Regents as we get started on discussion here to get the microphone square and center in front of you. These aren't quite as uh, sensitive as our microphones at uh, McNamara, so please be sure and do that. And uh, I'd open it up for board discussion at this point. Looking for uh, if there's questions or comments or we have the motion properly in front of us to approve it. So, Regent Rosha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll, I'll get us started. I. Um, I'd start by, by putting a motion to uh, postpone and, until uh, the June meeting. Um, then I would follow up with a, a ba the basis if there's a second. So you're making a motion to postpone? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion on uh, postponement of this transaction. You'd like to discuss your motion. Regent I, Rosha. I, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I... I um, Appreciate the indulgence of administration and the board um, and asking a, a lot of questions as I've tried to um, understand uh, all the dynamics of this. It's a long, long-term decision at a minimum, probably in the 16-year range, depending on how many of the, ex you know, the extensions we use and, and possibly couldn't consider the longer. But with, I'm not going to go into that at, at this point. I'm not speaking to the main motion. I'm speaking to the motion to postpone. Um, Regents policy uh, requires that contracts um, in excess of a million dollars in certain real estate transactions require board approval. Um, and uh, a moment ago, we, uh, you know, the, the, I believe the, the statement was that we haven't finalized the purchase agreement. If we haven't finalized the purchase agreement and the terms in the purchase agreement, we, we're not really passing, we're not, we're not adopting that contract, we're not approving that contract, we don't know what the contract is yet. Um, but more to the point, if um, if we end up with a lease for this space at 750, even at our current use without the NSF expansion, uh, a six-year contract is over a million dollars. So the board would have to approve that contract. So in order to have the sale of the property, we need to know what the terms of the lease are. And, and we won't know what the terms of the lease are until we understand through the NSF whether we got the grant and how much space we need. And that's, at that point, we need to approve that contract. That is a fundamental term of the purchase agreement that we would be asked to approve properly under board policy. And so um, I note that uh, the, this particular uh, bidder, um, the, the proposal that, that is being recommended for um, acceptance in general terms, uh, but not in specific contractual terms, um, requested a 90-day due diligence period in their RFP uh, uh, proposal uh, their proposal in response to the RFP, and actually in, in October, it was it was just over 60 days. So now it's 180. It seems that you know the June meeting were within the third, within 90 days, um, which would give us an opportunity to uh, hopefully understand that we have the NSF con uh, agreement and we would know what the terms of the lease are. And at that point, we'd be able to approve the terms of the lease as a part of the sale of this property. And we know we're not going to do it before that anyway. And so I believe we should follow our policy. Um, we don't have the terms of this contract, and therefore we should bring this back in June, which also would then certainly give us the chance to understand any questions that are outstanding on the terms of this and, and proceed with the vote at that time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Rosha. Other uh, comments from the board on the limited question of uh, the Rosha motion to postpone? Regent Chu. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a question for, um, I guess, who's over at the table? Um, have we ever, do we know whether or not Amazon Prime now would be interested in this property? 
Vice President Krieger. Regent McMillan, Regent Chu, uh, Amazon Prime was not one of the respondents to the RFP, so I would not be able to um, whether or not they are interested in this property. Regent Chu. Thank you. Um, I asked that question because Amazon Prime now, as most people know, is the two-hour delivery branch of Amazon.com. And their current location is one block away from uh, this property on 763 Casota, which um, is a, what, I, what I would believe in my limited logistics background is an ideal place for uh, a two-hour delivery service for the metro area. And, you know, in, especially in light of uh, the coronavirus um, um, situation that we're dealing with now, um, where people might be trying to buy stuff online and have it delivered to them as opposed to having to go out and uh, visit uh, retail locations in person. I think it's uh, worthy of uh, uh, checking with them to see if they would be interested in the property because I'm sure they would be able to pay more than $22 million for 22 acres, which is about a million dollars an acre. Uh, as anyone knows, on these other transactions, we're paying well well more than that, in some cases 10 times more than that, um, $10 million an acre um, within a couple miles of this particular location. Um, so, you know, I, su I support what uh, Regent Rocha said, but I also think that there um, are other opportunities that it should be looked at. If, if we didn't list the property, um, I'm not sure how many people really have access or we're looking at RFPs to redevelop property around the University of Minnesota, so it's not clear that uh, they even are aware of this uh, potential sale. Uh, on the motion to postpone, thank you, Regent Shu. Regent Swiggum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, members, I, uh, I speak against the uh, motion of postponement to a day certain. I think the day be, was it June? Um, or May, whichever day, uh, maybe it was the June, June meeting. Um, members, and in order to do so, I will speak about the uh, President's recommendation and the numbers that exist right there now, the numbers that we know. Um, a good lawyer will know the Latin term res ipsa laquatur, uh, which means it speaks for itself. Uh, Latin term, you don't have to say anything else. It speaks for itself, but I will speak for it just a little bit before it speaks for itself. It speaks for itself. Um, looking at the numbers, the numbers black and white directly tell you that the president's recommendation is prudent and we need to address it and we should address it now while we have a, a proposal before us. Um, you look at the, uh, and the, the, the startling thing that, uh, before I get to the numbers, is the one thing that uh, uh, Ms. Kruger brought forward, uh, uh, just that I acknowledge I didn't know before this, the, the newest building on that site is 43 years old. That's the newest building. Imagine the cost of maintenance that is necessary if that be the newest building for use on that, uh, uh, on that site. Uh, members, uh, first of all, and probably most importantly, no identified need for the property. No identified need that fits our mission as a university. So it probably then would be termed surplus property. Um, secondly, uh, the numbers that speak for themselves, if you look at the operating costs that have been given us to the administration, uh, somewhere around $600,000 a year in operating costs. Uh, somewhere around $50 million of capital costs over the next 20 years. Now, I'm sure that can be fudged one way or another, but those are significant monies that we're talking about. As the President is trying to bring forward her budget uh, in May, these are monies that uh, sometimes you can say throw good money after bad. I would say this is throwing good money maybe after good because we're going to be able to sell this property for four or five million dollars more than we paid for it. So maybe that's good. So it's good money after good rather than good money after bad. 
Um, but the fact is that we should be making prudently this transaction now. Uh, it was open for an RFP for a proposal. Uh, I believe it's a financial prudent thing to do, recognizing our fiduciary responsibility as a board, especially heading into uh, the budget that we get from the president in, in May. I, I don't want to see her come forward with a budget that's going to affect UMD. We're sitting there right now and, and having to consider spending $600,000 a year for property that we don't need. That, that doesn't make any sense what, at all. Resipsa laquatur. It speaks for itself. I would speak against the motion to postpone to a certain date. Thank you, Regent Swigum. Again, we are commenting and uh, advocating for or against the motion to to delay until uh, June, the, the, the Rosha motion. I have one other person I think wants to speak on that, and then we're going to take a vote. Regent Simonson. Yeah, just real quickly. Um, but with all the questions out there, I don't know why we couldn't postpone it, but I have a more basic question. The Board of Regents uh, uh, office sent out an email a week or so ago, if I recall, <clears throat> on, on policies on transactions like this. And the one thing that sticks in my mind is it said we needed two independent appraisals. I think I only saw one. I'm going to uh, assume that... Uh... Vice President Krieger can answer that. She's got her hand up, so why don't you respond? Chair McMillan, Regent Simonson, the policy reads that when we acquire a property, we need two independent appraisals. It is not that specific for disposal. We have one recent appraisal and then two older appraisals for the warehouse property. Okay. Um, Regent Rocha, quickly in response. Yeah, thank you. On, on the delay motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and in, in specifically in response to the, the comments about um, the, the novel use of res ipsa loquitur, um, in, in this case, it's, in this case, I would, it, I'm not speaking to the merits. I don't, I don't quarrel with you on that. But um, it's, uh, um, the question is, do we follow our policies or not? Do we believe in following the law or not? Our law is, that we approve contracts that exceed a million dollars and we approve the sale of of real estate of this certainly this easily qualifies within that and within that we don't know the terms yet because a fundamental term in the RFP and in and in the in the proposal is the rent rate is what what the lease is going to be because there's a pretty substantial difference um, in fact in the RFP that at least the one that to which I've been um, uh, given access, the, the, the proposal that was provided, it was a different lease rate and one that was more favorable to the university. So the fact is that um, we, we know that, that we're talking about a 180-day due diligence period that was requested. We know that um, the, this potential buyer can work under 90 days to complete their due diligence. We know it's highly unlikely that before June we would have an answer to this question and have this all completed. Therefore, I think as, as a board, you start out with the rule of law. You follow your rules. And if you don't follow your rules, then the rest of your rules really don't mean much. So the fact that we don't know the terms yet prevent us from being able to move forward on it. All of the other merits that you've described as to why we would sell versus why we wouldn't certainly stand to be, to be discussed. And they would be discussed in June at that point in time. I just, it's, it's really remarkable to me that we would say we want to engage in a sale of a of this variety, but we don't actually know the terms yet. At that point, you're delegating that which our policy does not delegate. So once the terms are known, that would be brought back to the board, and the board could at that point in time discuss the merits, if there's even a discussion at that point, or whether there's just simply a ratification of the, of the proposal at that point. But we don't know the terms of the sale, because we don't know what the lease rate is going to be in the amount and the, and the, and the, and the term. And that is not a contract. If you don't have those fundamental terms, you have no contract to approve. If you have no contract to approve, we do not meet our own policy. Therefore, we should postpone till June. If there is a cost other, that I'm not aware of by having this conversation when we know those terms, I'd be interested in hearing it, but I don't anticipate the administration expects to sell the property by that point. And so this board should not put the cart before the horse. And we, should, we should approve a, a contract where we know the terms, and that's what I'm asking for with this motion. I All have right. a comment, Janie, later on. 
Uh, Regent Mayeron, you haven't uh, spoken yet, so if you want to speak on the uh, Rosha um, postponement motion, please go forward. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I really have a question, and this has to do with the fact that uh, still in that status of being a new regent, but my impression is, at least since I've been on the board, that there have been instances where we have uh, approved transactions where there, it contemplated that there had to be further negotiations on certain terms that bore on those transactions. So I'm for those who have been on the board or whether uh, General Counsel Peterson can answer it or whomever, the question is, is this somehow different that we're being asked to do here than with other transactions? Is it similar as to what we've done in the past? That's my question. Thank you, uh, Regent Mayor. On I will, without directly answering your question, because I'm not sure I'm the right one to do it. We, we, we approve transactions. We just did with the KUMD sale, where we approve the outline of a, of a commercial transaction, and then it goes through multiple uh, revisions, and ultimately will come back to us in final form. And uh, that's how I see this. I see, Regent, or I see uh, Vice President <coughs> Krieger's hand up, maybe to add some more clarity to Regent Mayron's question. Chair McMillan, Regent Mayron, uh, this is a similar situation to what we had with the Shriners purchase in which the purchase agreement in which we were on the, the buying end of that property had a provision that the purchase was contingent <coughs> upon the successful negotiation of a six-month lease back by the Shriners organization. And so the lease back was not negotiated at the time of the purchase agreement but was negotiated during the, uh, during the due diligence process. The purchase agreement for, for this property allows for or requires that the uh, sale is contingent upon this successful negotiation. It will include the $7.50 per square foot. And so that gives us the direction to proceed and that the lease back would occur, the leasing negotiations would be finalized during that 180-day uh, due diligence process, and the lease would be brought back to the board for review and action at that at the time prior to the 180-day due diligence period expiring. Thank you, um, Regent Shu. Thank you. We've, that answers uh, my question. Okay. Thank you, Regent Mayeron and uh, Regent Shu. Quickly on this on this motion. Uh, well, just in in response to Regent Swigum's. Um, uh, analysis of the costs related to holding um, this property. I think we're also at a point in time uh, where refinancing um, could make a big difference in terms of whatever holding cost your calculation comes up with. And I would just submit that uh, um, a, a delay would actually allow us to relook at the numbers and uh, determine whether uh, any in, in that analysis. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to uh, ask for a vote now on the Rosha motion to delay until June, and I'd ask for all those in favor to signify so with the sign of aye. 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 Oh, I'm going to stop that. I, I misvoted. I, <laughs> I do not support. I'll be very clear. <laughs> Sorry. I do not support the delay motion, so we'll do that again. All the in chair, favor I, of? I was pleasantly surprised yes. for a moment there. Thank <laughs> you for that brief moment of excitement. It's been a long week. Um, we'll call that vote again. My mistake. I apologize. All in favor of the Rosha motion to delay until June, signify so with a sign of aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. Nay. No. That motion fails, and uh, we move on now to the motion before the board, which is to approve the transaction recommended by, by President Gable. And uh, I see that a couple regents have already signed up, and uh, one of those being uh, Regent Beeson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, colleagues. Um, uh, I think Re Regent Roche and I were the only, maybe the only ones that have actually toured this site. It was a, uh, it was an eye opener. Um, 
but a uh, an important um, an important step along the way. We those of us who were on the board back when we purchased this own this situation, and um, this has been characterized as an opportunistic purchase. That's sort of polite. It was we really went through a lot of red lights. We didn't go through our pre-design. We didn't sufficiently consult our internal users. It was done on a hunch. Uh, done. It's a, it's an impressive property by by the number of acres, uh, by is has been characterized how a crow flies. Well, how a crow flies to the property isn't how students can get there or how cars can get there. It's not it's not that close. Um, one of the things I'm really upset about was looking back at the at the materials from several years ago was that this board was never told that the property could be put back to the university in the amount of square footage that it was. And the property we got back almost day two uh, turned out to be property that's unusable. And that created a negative cash flow situation immediately out of which we can't ever, we can't, we can't emerge unless or until we sell this property. And that's in addition to not having strong numbers on the renovation, the life safety improvements. We're not even talking about the numbers to convert the properties. And our internal users have said that, that it doesn't work. It doesn't work to retrofit these buildings for the purpose that we need. So adding all that up, 20 million to buy it, millions of dollars of losses. We can argue about some of that detail. Uh, the arguments can be made about clearing the site. That's another $20 million to tear the buildings down. We could have $40 million plus just with some vacant ground. And this property is not, we have property we have bought that is worth 10 times more than this site. So I would, I would disagree with Regent Chu um, on that. One benefit of this whole process is that we know now that we have 35 acres, more acreage than we have at Murphy with the Southeast Como. This is a sleepy little area off Como Avenue, Southeast Minneapolis. It's got some housing, it's got low rise buildings. We, we need a plan for that. And that's out of this, you know, whether that plan needs to, to activate now or soon, but we ought to be focusing on that site. We own the property, probably free and clear. And uh, uh, I would also say, you know, this property was solicited for, for sale. Every developer looks at the, the finance and commerce, they don't ever miss this. So everybody had a shot at this uh, last last fall. Um, this is a specialized piece of property. There aren't many developers that can handle this site. It's a tough site. And what they want to do with it is going to improve the area. Uh, so I think we have, uh, I think we have uh, presented the site. Uh, well, we could try to hold on to it in hopes of sort of, we could muddle through this and a holding strategy and hope for appreciation. The property will probably appreciate, but we're gonna be incurring losses. It's a big distraction. At the end of the day, the site can't house our need, our uses in there for the, within the buildings that are, that, are, uh, that are standing there. One other comment on the Murphys. I knew Richard Murphy. I knew his father, Dick Murphy. I don't think they would view these properties as shrines that the family would insist that they that that university would have to own forever. I think they would understand that you know we can we can change our mind and that circumstances change. Uh, maybe they're disappointed, but they were given a fair market. It was a business agreement, and uh, I think they would under. I hope they'll understand that family. They've certainly been great friends of the university. That's those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Regent Peach and uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was expecting Regent Beeson on follow-up of his familiarity with the Mr. Murphy that you're no Richard Murphy, Regent Rocha. <laughs> so, um, well, I, you know, the votes have been whipped. We know, we sort of know what the count is. We've had a little preview, but um, I, I, I'm gonna I ask for a roll call as we go forward because I think this is gonna have significant impacts going forward. Um, I've asked, asked many questions um, in hoping to get a, a better understanding myself um, in clarity. And uh, I asked a series of questions as recently as last evening um, as to some of the assumptions and costs that were being um, 
characterized, uh, and I will spare the board walking through all of those questions this morning. Um, a uh, tilting at windmills uh, exercise won't help much. Um, but the numbers are not accurate. Uh, we know that there are numbers in those numbers that we received last evening, uh, which I received roughly uh, shortly before 10, uh, 10 p.m. when I got back to my, uh, my room. Um, it includes a lot of expenses that are not going away with the sale of this property. You know, we know on the, on the sheet that I attached to an email um, last week that, you know, we have um, proportion of fees. We've got uh, uh, this other debt uh, percent share of under recovery. That doesn't, that, that money still has to be paid. It doesn't, it doesn't go away with the sale of this property. We also didn't, you know, when we valued the, the, the use of our property, of, of our, our use of the property, um, we were using it as an, at an internal discount rate, but we know what the value of the property is, at least by virtue of what's being proposed by, uh, in, in this particular uh, purchase option. Um, I did not speak to this in the, on the previous motion, but there's a fairly massive difference between us purchasing the Shriner property and us selling this property to the extent in that case we hold the cards as to what the lease back rate is. Here we're on the other side of that ledger. We don't have the leverage on that lease back and the term and the length. But this is what's really surprising to me. Um, I, we heard it twice already this morning about disposal. You know, this is the surplus property concept. Disposal may occur when it is determined the real estate is no longer needed now or in the future. We're using tens of thousands of square feet right now. The, the old understanding of surplus property was uh, uh, an 80 acre parcel up in Itasca County that had been donated by an alum that we have never used for anything. It's not needed, we weren't using it then, and we wouldn't be using it in the future. We already know that we need this now, because we're using it now, and we're looking at potentially 16 more years that we would use it. That's not a disposal. It's a change in the financial arrangement, but that's a totally different analysis. But I asked a series of questions, where are these things gonna go? You know, where are we gonna put this other storage that was identified in, in uh, December of 2015? We don't know. We don't know where those things are gonna go. Right now, you, you know, we, I, I did pose the question, where's this extra $400,000 annually that we're spending on, on maintaining this property? We already know what the obligation of our lessee is. And, you know, are there personnel that, I mean, that's $1,000 a day that we're spending reportedly to maintain this property. That's just not realistic. You know, when, when we went there, Regent Beeson, I didn't see several trucks of people making 50 bucks an hour sitting, you know, sitting on that property for the university's purposes. And so I think that, I think what we've done is we've taken parts of other expenses that are going to remain and we've apportioned them to this property and, and, and that way we inflated the amount of the cost of, of maintaining this property. I think we've taken the amount of income or the value of what we're using with this property and we've reduced it to the minimum to try to create that spread. When we look at the appraisal of this property, I, I understand that there was an RFP, I understand, I had a chance to review uh, uh, some of the proposals recently. You know, in the appraisal um, that, you know, the commentary that we received last night um, was about a, a comparable, you know, a land value on comparables. The, the six comparables, the closest one was at 280 and 35W, and that was done in 2017. Totally different, totally different location. Then you had St. Cloud, Hutchinson, White Bear Township, St. Cloud, and Fridley. If anybody thinks those markets have anything to do with the value of property around the university, um, our race ipsa loquit or moment on the value of the property is the 10 and 15 million dollars per acre that we're spending within a, a, a couple blocks of that location. Granted, there's, there's some distinction there, but we already know from the answers to the questions, some of the questions I posed, we haven't even looked into being able to connect that. Regent Sviggum, what was our access to the West Bank when the university acquired it? What did it look like compared to today? And so, I mean, these are things that it's, it's this board's job to be looking very far forward. The fact is we know that we need to place the library archive. We know, but we haven't identified where on Como. You know what, if we could, if you could, somebody came back and said, this is where we've got this expected to go, and this is our timeline for it, and this is our expected cost, and here's why it's better than putting it on this property, I'd have no quarrel. But we aren't even answering those questions. 
you know, our job is to protect the university. Our job is to look forward and say, what is the next generation going to do with this? I also note that, that we did have the prospect of a lease, of a 99-year ground lease in, in response to our RFP, where we would have continued to be able to use, you know, what we're using, and then the part that has been the Achilles heel for us, which is these older, old buildings that really don't serve any purpose. You know, when we got these, when we got the data that brought us here today about how to renovate the warehouses, as I stated in my, in my email, um, it answers a question we never asked because we know we're never going to use that for warehouse space. So spending 20 to $50 million in renovating it really is sort of nonsensical and it sort of seems to, to support a foregone conclusion as opposed to really educate us on what our opportunities are with this space. So, you know, we can, we can make the arguments, we'll certainly have the vote, but we're not right. And, and this opportunity for us to consolidate the storage and the things that we were told back in 2015, uh, really 2016 for all practical purposes, they still remain. The value of the space that we could free up for departments all over the flagship campus, it, 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 you know, we know that's the 10 to $15 million space, but we're not doing it. The decision has obviously been made and the votes have been counted. And so I'll vote no, and um, I, I will um, watch with chagrin as we find needs in the future that we don't have space to, uh, to accommodate. Thank you. Regent Powell. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks, Chair uh, McMillan. So I wasn't here uh, when we acquired it, and I'm not going to, so I won't comment on um, those circumstances. Uh, Regent Beeson, I think, did a very good job of kind of, uh, kind of laying out the, the situation. But what I want to do is, what, what I'd like to comment on is just to say that um, uh, I think over the last uh, couple of months, as we've continued to dig into this, if, if anything, I mean, there's been very good work done. Uh, we've answered questions. We've done some analysis. If anything, I think uh, uh, greatly strengthened uh, the case for uh, selling this property. And I think that, and I think the case was was made pretty well a couple of months ago. But we've done good work. I think the staff has done good work. We've engaged third parties uh, to you know deepen our understanding. Uh, and I think today we understand uh, you know even better than we did a few months ago that this property has many challenges uh, in, uh, uh, and costs in adopting it to our needs. Uh, uh, and is really for a variety of reasons, including the age, the condition, the nature of, con of the construction. It's just not suited uh, to our purposes. The location is not ideal. We've actually learned that uh, uh, the most recent appraisal we have, we probably overpaid. Uh, I think where that appraisal was 17 million, right? we paid we paid 18. We've engaged very qualified third parties, and I think we have a, a, a deeper understanding today of the holding costs uh, in in great detail, which are very significant. It's going to be millions of dollars uh, over the next uh, six years, and so. Um, so I think we have a, a, a I feel we have a, a deeper, better understanding of uh, uh, what we have here now, uh, and it is a very good decision uh, to get out from under uh, the ownership of this property. It's expensive to hold. It really isn't applicable to um, you know, to our uses, and the the the. Uh, the, the money that we're going to uh, save uh, 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 by not having uh, to uh, invest in holding costs are far better used elsewhere. So I will be supporting the sale. Thank you, Regent Powell. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I won't reiterate many of the comments that have already been made. Um, just highlight some bullet points. Um, I, too, obviously wasn't here at the time of the purchase, but it has become clear that Certainly there were, I don't know if you want to characterize them as missteps or whatever, but essentially later finding out that the very uses that the property was purchased for were not viable um, just clearly shows some sort of lack in due diligence, but that's, that's in the past. I think we have to discuss the sale now. Um, the factors I consider are that there's no clearly identified current or future use. It, um, we are leasing it and using it, so um, before... Let me just clarify that, you know, we are using it, but, but for the property as a whole, we don't have that clear um, identified current or future use. The other thing is that um, ownership is a liability. Um, and I like that it was clarified that the, the current proposal is a as-is sale, um, as in we're not liable for any improvements before the sale. And, and I just think holding the property into the future opens us, opens us up to the liability of whatever improvements or, 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 or environmental um, 
things that, 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 that may come up. And then lastly, but perhaps most importantly, is um, you know, our resources are finite. It's zero sum. And, and any, any, any resources and time that we're going to have to invest in this property are, are resources and time that we're not investing in mission um, where there's a lot of need, where there's a lot of needs um, for facilities that are serving mission um, throughout the system. So just wanted to reiterate those three points and say that I will be supporting the resolution. Thank you. Um, I do note the time here. We're almost at the end of uh, our entire committee time, so, but I, I, I don't want to cut the dialogue off. I'm going to ask if Regent Mayeron wants to jump in before I forget her, and then I've got uh, Regent Shu, and that's the lineup right now. So, Regent Mayeron. All right, thank you. I think that the comments uh, that have been made, and in particular following up on the comments by <laughs> Regent Kenyatta, uh, state my position on this. Uh, the administration laid out basically four factors to consider that I think will be part of any strategic planning that we will do on uh, land development, whether it's acquisition or disposal. Uh, and that is uh, that this project or this property, if we continue to hold on to it, will involve significant capital investment uh, for repairs. Uh, the original purpose that it was purchased for is no longer viable. The physical location is not consistent with where the direction we are moving geographically. We can sell this at a profit, and we know uh, from the information that has been provided, and I'm satisfied that if we hold on to it, we will continue to um, be pouring uh, good money after bad, uh, and it will be a loss. So. Uh, for all of those reasons, I will be voting in favor of the sale and disposition of the property. Thank you, Regent Mayron. Regent Chu. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, I will I will be voting no on this, and I'll explain why. Uh, could we have page forty four uh, back on the screen, please? Uh, 44 in the docket. I don't know. It's page. It's the map. So page oh, two. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at this now, people are talking about how close it is to the university. Well, it's so close that it's in the middle of what we own. Okay, Como being up there in the upper right. That little dot over there, or not dot, but the little piece of property on the same street is where we're going to put this child development center. Okay, we're going to invest $36 million right down the street from where this is. This is not out of the way. It is not, uh, uh, it is not something that should be declared surplus, even if we weren't using it, because I think we should have uh, a plan for how, do we, how we use this property in the future. Um, I'm disappointed in the process because um, it came up and we didn't really even have a full discussion on it the last time, and uh, we postponed it. And then we were told Ryan wasn't interested until just recently we were told that, hey, there's still a deal here, and um, now we're having this discussion again, but we never really concluded the discussion the first time around. Dick Murphy, who, who Regent Beeson mentioned, he was so upset about this that he actually thought he would buy it back because he he wanted the university to have it. They, they used a, uh, a price that was uh, below the value at the time, and um, I, think, um, I think he would have tried to buy it back. He would have offered more because he knew the value, and if the university didn't, didn't want it, he would do something else with it. But he died in December. So nothing was going to happen there. Now, the other thing is, you know, ownership is an opportunity for us. And just to dispose of it, because we, we think that we're in the warehouse business all of a sudden, we're not in, a warehouse, in the warehouse business. All of the numbers presented to us were to bring the property up to being in the warehouse business. And we're not in the warehouse business, and I don't think everyone, anyone ever suggested that we should be in the warehouse business. But we should be in the business of understanding what the opportunities are for land around campus. And I know everyone wants to push east and southeast and all that, but this is right in the middle of where we are. 
and we should be looking to expand in, in any direction we can. And uh, the railroad tracks, you know, yes, the railroad tracks are um, in between, but there are people who are actively trying to build um, a bridge across the railroad tracks. Um, there's also the, the fact that, uh, you know, it, it is not that far away from where, where, um, where the main part of campus is. And if, if you look at it on here, <laughs> it's as big or almost as big as our Bierman facility, which is incredible, an incredible amount of space. And we're not going to find 22 acres anywhere near campus any time in, in the future. And so I think it's a mistake uh, to sell it, and um, I'm disappointed in the process that we're going through to sell it. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. So everybody that originally wanted to speak at this point has, and uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, forego my own comments on this. And rather, before I open it up for another round, is, is there, does anyone have any more questions that, or anything else they want to add to this? Then I'm going to call the vote. Regent Kenyanya? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to just ask a question on something that Regent Chu alluded to, probably for AVB Krieger. Okay. Um, just a clarifying question. My, it's my understanding that in the original sale, um, the, and I, I don't know the exact terms, but the, the seller was allowed to exit out of part of that lease back after X amount of time, and they exercised that. And the university was also allowed to to sell after X amount of time, and that's what we're exercising? AVP Krieger. Chair McMillan, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, that is correct. The, the seller, in, in the lease, the seller is allowed to terminate portions of their current lease with a six-month notice. And they exercised that on the older buildings shortly after the sale. The university, as part of the acquisition of the property, uh, signed a document related to tax, form, uh, tax forms, and I don't have the number of the tax form uh, in my head, but uh, that uh, acknowledged that the difference in the purchase price from the Murphy's appraisal and they were able to use that for their tax deduction. And as part of that tax form, it specifies that if the university were to sell within three years, that we would need to file another form that basically says that the uh, there there was an you know that the um, donation had lost some of its value or something to that effect. I'm not a tax attorney. Oh. Th thank it you. It was for three answer. years, Mr. Chair. I was just. I was just asking that clarifying question because that would lead me to believe that the family understood that we could exercise the right to dispose of the property within three years. So that would just lead me to believe that there wasn't an expectation that we would hold it in perpetuity because it was part of the contract. That's just my comment. You've stated the, the transaction as the, the, the deal as it was. That's my understanding and what general counsel has given us. There were provisions built into it that allowed the, uh, the lessee to exit. And they did, and there were provisions built into it that allowed us to exit, and that's what we're contemplating today, four years, four and a half years after the deal was consummated, and I think it required a three-year holding pattern. I'm going to call the vote, and it's been requested that uh, we do a roll call vote, so Mr. Langworthy, I'd ask you to call the roll. Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Herr is absent. Regent Shu, no. Regent Shu votes no. Regent Kinyanya. Yes. Regent Kinyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rosha. No. Regent Rosha votes no. Regent Simonson. No. Regent Simonson votes no. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair McMillan. Yes. Chair McMillan votes yes. That uh, appears to have carried on an eight to three vote, so uh, we, uh, we move on with approval of 
the motion. And on to item uh, four on our agenda, which is additional real estate transactions, purchases this time. And uh, Vice President Krieger, I believe you're going to walk us through those, beginning with 414 Erie and then 2829 University. Thank you, Chair McMillan. The second real estate item on the agenda today is the proposed acquisition proposed acquisition of 414 Erie Street, Minneapolis. We are requesting this transaction be review and action today. The subject property of 414 Erie Street consists of a two and a half story walk up apartment uh, constructed in 1969. It is situated on 16,870 square feet of land located on the west side of Erie Street between Delaware Street and Essex Street. As you will note on the map, the property is bordered on the north, west, and south by Dinikin Properties Argyle House, which is owned by the University of Minnesota Foundation. The apartment building consists of five one-bedroom and 12 two-bedroom rental units, and additionally, there are 22 surface parking stalls on the site. This is just some quick photos of the property. And again, we asked the question of what is the strategic value to the university of, of acquiring this property? The university has no immediate use for the property for direct mission related purposes. However, the purchase of this property would allow for the future ownership of, by the university of the entire block, which in this block has been designated for future growth, a future growth area for the clinical, clamp, clinical campus in the long term. In the meantime, the university intends to either continue operating the building as apartment rentals with a third party property manager, or the university will demolish the structure for additional surface parking. The University will purchase the property from Richard Rupert, who has owned and operated the building since 1969. The total purchase price for the property will be $3.795 million, which is consistent with the appraisals conducted as part of the due diligence process and the university will issue debt to purchase the property. Our due diligence period is 60 days in length and will conclude on April 27, 2020. The closing shall occur 30 days after following the expiration of this due diligence period and a facilities condition assessment and environmental review are underway. Assessments during the due diligence period will determine the level of the deferred maintenance of the property <clears throat> and whether the building can effectively continue to be operated for rental housing. If the university determines that during, during our due diligence that uh, the continuation of the building as rental housing, then those rental units, that rental revenue will be used to offset some of the debt. If the facilities condition reveals extensive de deferred maintenance and the university will demolish the property and util utilize it for surface parking. And with that, I stand for questions. Thank you. Is there a uh, motion from the committee to approve the purchase? Is that here? Okay. Is there a second? Second. Very good. Moved and seconded. The matters before the committee now for uh, questions uh, or input for the administration here. Is there any? Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, yes, I, I will support this, but I will note that this is about $10 million an acre. Thank you. Regent Rocha. Mr. I, I just have a process question. So um, our, our standard process is information one month and action another. This um, and, and I think that we do a disservice to the public and to the board if we do, if, if that simply becomes a, an optional thing. What is the basis for deviating from our information action um, um, process typically? Regent Rocha, you and I share a strong commitment to uh, the review action protocol and uh, of any region on the board. I probably raised this more than any in terms of, of this, so I don't approach review action lightly, and, uh, but I understand in the real estate world that uh, opportunities and, uh, and challenges arise quickly and the need for quick action is there. So I'm, I'm not answering the question. I'm going to turn to either Vice President Krieger or Senior Vice President Burnett for the answer, but I have a slightly lower threshold in terms of my personal view of that when it comes to this. 
I don't know what you want to tackle Regent Rocha's question. Chair McMillan, Regent Rocha, in this case, uh, in both of the cases today for our acquisitions, we are requesting review and action, and we do take, uh, we also take that pr uh, process issue very seriously. And so in this case, we shared with the board via attorney-client privilege memo the reasons for that uh, request. Uh, it has to do with just our um, ability to negotiate with this property owner on, on, the, on the acquisition. Regent Rocha. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that, and I'm, I'm not surprised, but I think we would, you know, virtually any contract with any vendor or otherwise, it's always easier if you can move more rapidly. But I think, you know, certainly with a, a part-time board as ours and, and, and with a public that, you know, expects the public institution to be forthcoming, what I, what I would prefer, Mr. Chair, and, and as, as we go forward on these, is it would be more of a matter of, you know, unless there's an emergency where we're going to lose the deal, um, I mean, we have this negotiated deal, and we could do information this month, and, um, you know, if we were still meeting monthly, we could do it in April, but in this case, we would do it in May, and whether that, whether there's a real risk that the party is going to withdraw the offer or, or someone else is going to sneak in, that's one thing, but otherwise, my preference would be to use what I think we've designated as um, it comes for information, and if on a matter like this where it seems to be without controversy and the whole board is, is, is in favor of moving forward, we would do that. But if any member of the board, uh, my, my view is in protecting every member of this board's right to get the information they need to exercise their judgment on behalf of, of, of the state, uh, and on behalf of the university, that um, they would then, if anyone objects, that would give them the additional time to get that information. I don't see this as controversial, but I see a trend of, of information action at a single meeting, and I, I, I think that starts to move us away from the public's expectation and it certainly moves away from my capacity as a member to get information I need if and when I need it. So I just put that caveat out there. Thank you. Fair input. Uh, thank you. And I think in months where we have consecutive meetings, i.e. September, October, or, uh, you know, May, June, I think we really should hold that standard unless there's a dire commercial need. But in months where we're separated by, uh, you know, 60 days, I can see this coming up. But Anyway, thank you for the input. As committee leader, I'll uh, take that to heart, and I'm sure uh, board leadership will too. Any other questions on the, pros, the proposed purchase of the 414 Erie property? All right. Let's uh, call that for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Regent Maron, you might have got two eyes in there. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was unmuted in time, so I had only one eye. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent, uh, sorry, Vice President Krieger, why don't you move right into 2829 University? And our final real estate transaction this morning is the acquisition of 2829 University Avenue Southeast and 2721 4th Street Southeast in Minneapolis. The reason for this real estate transaction being requested review and action today has to do with the uh, leasing on the part of the seller. And so the seller took a great risk in terms of not renewing some leases uh, as a result of the negotiations um, with the university. And we would like to be able to give the seller the certainty that the university will be moving forward with this transaction. Uh, in, 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 and if the university chooses not to move forward this transaction, that, that the seller can go out and start seeking uh, new leases for the for the property. And so that is the reason today in this case for the review and action. 2829 University, otherwise known as University Park Plaza, is, a one and a, is on a one and a half acre parcel, improved with a nine story multi-tenant office building which was constructed in 1972. The building contains over 140,000 gross square feet. Most everyone will recognize the building once you see the photo. Um, some of us certainly of a certain age fondly call it the TV building. Uh, those of the, the student regents, uh, representatives to the regents, won't recognize that, uh, uh, that reference <laughs> given they've grown up in the digital age and don't recognize the, what old TVs used to look like. Uh, <laughs> The property features, the property also features a five level 350 story parking ramp, or 350 stall, sorry, parking ramp. And then there is an additional 57 stalls of detached parking across 4th Street adjacent to the transitway. 
One of the reasons this is an appealing location for the university is because the property is adjacent to the Prospect Park light rail station, which is one stop east of the Stadium Village station. Photos of the parking structure in the parking lot. So again, considering the acquisition of the property and what is its strategic value, the university has identified the need for additional office space on the east bank of the, east, of the Twin Cities campus to accommodate a number of planned developments over the next several years. Construction of a new separate administrative office building is cost prohibitive, and in the past the university has opted to buy an existing office building on the edge of campus or near campus to accommodate these needs, such as in the case of 20, 20, of the university office plaza or the West Bank office building. Office needs include swing space for upcoming major construction projects on the East Bank, the displacement of administrative units from Fraser Hall to accommodate the proposed chem teaching facility, the 2022 expiration of our lease in the Dinikin office building, the displacement of staff from the IT building at 2018 University Avenue as part of the Southeast Gateway development, and the eventual decommissioning of the Mayo building. It's important to note that not all of these projects can and should be accommodated in this building, but this particular property is attractive because of the location adjacent to the light rail, the recent capital investments that have been made by the seller, and the university's history of renting space in the building. The existing leases in the, in the building expire in staggered terms, which then allow us to realize the space for university use as those leases expire. And although this property is located beyond our master plan boundaries, the acquisition will facilitate our priority reinvesting in the campus core. The purchase price for the subject properties will be $20,710,000. This is higher than the appraised value of the property from a land value and an income value based approach, but is significantly lower than the replacement value based approach. We believe this price is justified due to the recent capital improvements made by the seller and the university's ability to phase into the space. The university will assume the existing leases upon closing and the university will issue debt to purchase the property. A portion of the debt payments will be funded by the rental revenues for the property, which will be phased out over time as the university occupies the space. The university has completed a third uh, party facilities condition assessment in order to identify future capital, capital requirements. And we have completed the phase one and phase two environmental assessment to confirm the property is an acceptable environmental com condition prior to close. With that I stand for questions. Thank you, Vice President Krieger. So two questions um, and then we'll further questions from the rest of the, uh, the committee, but does this acquisition of what, you know, looks like reasonable, reasonably conditioned office space and with, with tremendous access to the campus as far as the light rail and parking, which seems to be always be a challenge, does it ultimately in a bigger picture give you and the administration the chance to start looking at at perhaps pulling in some rather disparately located facilities, and I and I don't want you to you know, speculate at all, but it feels like we've got you know some significant university space quite a ways from campus. When I think about things like W. Bob and that, and maybe you can speak a little bit about future plans without getting into specific buildings that you don't know yet. But I would hope we start to consolidate and not continue to be over. That's Chair one, and then I'll have a follow-up. So, Chair McMillan, when this property was first brought to our attention, that was the first thing that came to mind, is that this would be an opportunity to potentially uh, uh, dispose of W. Bob if possible. This location is, you know, there are a number of uses um, at the university and a number of units at the university that need to be near campus but don't need to be right in the campus core. And W. Bob serves a, that purpose, but, for, uh, but it does not have the transit access uh, that really is, su supports that, whereas this, this particular property does, being one stop uh, east of 
east of campus. And so that was the first thing that came to mind. In the meantime, we have, as I noted in the presentation, we have a number of more immediate uh, space needs that are going to come up, uh, which we can fill into this space as the leases expire. And so again, uh, as the East Gateway development moves into uh, fruition, uh, the Dinikin office building that we currently lease space in uh, from the foundation, will that ex lease will expire, and that will be a great place to put these folks, as well as the IT building, uh, which is also part of the land transaction, and this will be another great place to put those folks. So we have some urgent needs that are going to come up, as well as in some of those long-term possibilities that this space provides us. Okay. So my second question um, evolves from your final bullet point and your due diligence. Uh, the phase one, phase two environmental, and uh, the, you know, the risk manager in me is now looking for some degree of certainty that we aren't getting into another setting like we did with the University Village and, uh, you know, worse on the other side of the tracks as we took down the, uh, the, uh, the steel elevators and some of those places. This always can be a quagmire and and an expensive one if there's things we don't know about and we're not protecting ourselves appropriately. So help us as, a, as a members of your governing board feel like we're taking every step we need to there. Chair McMillan, I apologize for skipping over some of my presentation in the interest of time. That's okay. No but apology we needed. Did, so. um, we did mm -hmm. conduct a phase one, and as a result of that phase one, a phase two sub slab vapor sampling was conducted, uh, just as we did with University Village. But unlike University Village, where we determined that based upon that sub slab testing, we needed to install a vapor uh, mitigation, int vapor intrusion mitigation system. This, uh, these results of the sub-slab sub -slab sampling uh, resulted in no uh, indications of soil vapor contaminants at concentrations that would indicate any vapor intrusion concern. So we did do that due diligence and are satisfied with the results. Okay. Other, uh, Regent Rocha and then Regent Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, th these are important, I think. Uh, and, you know, we've gone through a lot of iterations. We had, you know, 1313 University. We've had a lot of different properties historically that have been for swing space and administrative space. Um, FMC, now I think you lovingly referred to as WBOB. Um, do, do we own that free and clear? Uh, the Vice President Krieger. Chair McMillan, Regent Rocha, I am not quite sure about the debt uh, service on that building. I'm okay. not sure if... Uh, our CFO can answer that or anybody it's, in the room. It's, not, it's not that relevant. I, th I think we've had it a long time, but it started out as a lease for swing space and then has obviously become a part of the fabric of, of our administrative offerings. And so, you, you know, th this is important space. Um, frankly, this is in, you know, where I would have ideally seen the uh, East Gateway developing more here because where East Gateway is developing is much more is closer to campus for student life and, and access for faculty and so on, but uh, off we go with that. But so the, the, the two questions I have, do we, do we have a, an, an understanding just f for clarification on what we expect the debt service to be on this and what, what does it generate in, in revenue now to meet the debt service? And then finally, um, when will these leases, when do you anticipate the, the, the range of leases? I know that this, some of this is in the materials, but what, when do the, will we start being able to actually use this, this property? Vice President Krieger. Chair McMillan, Regent Rocha, I apologize. I was going to add an additional slide, um, a backup slide related to the staggering of those leases. Uh, we have a preliminary pro forma that we've developed and given the fact that the um, leases as they expire will not be renewed and we're not using this as a, uh, an income generating property, it's the intention is that we would actually be filling it with university uses. So the leases at, while they're in place will help with offset some of that debt, they will not cover the debt and um, particularly because the major a uh, tenant in the building are, is the state of Minnesota, and many of the state boards are located in the building, and those leases expire in ja uh, January 31st of 2021. So a significant portion of the leases will expire about 50,000 square feet, and that's when we'll start having availability of that key swing space uh, for some of our capital projects that we've got uh, planned for next year. 
Follow up, Regent Rocha. I just, just can, so sometimes we pay for space that we use. Not, no further questions, Your Honor. All right, uh, Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, I will support this, although I will note that this is even more than $10 million an acre, but it does come with a fairly nice building and fairly nice parking structure, and I know we need parking, especially on that end of campus. Um, but I will note that this is actually farther away than Murphy Warehouse, and, you know, is cited uh, as a positive thing being on the light rail. Um, I am concerned because uh, I don't really understand how the light rail, rail works with our university um, people in terms of what light rail passes they have. Um, also, the crime on light rail is, is um, uh, skyrocketing, apparently, and so I have concerns about um, locating um, people farther away from campus where they have to take light rail. Maybe they can drive there and park, I don't know. But uh, I, will, I will support this, and I, I um, hope that uh, other property along the university becomes available also. Thank you. Regent uh, Beeson, then Regent Anderson, then we're going to uh, call the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do support the resolution I am, as both uh, Chair um, McMillan and Regent Roche have mentioned the, this, the, the, I think we're going to need some, we need a plan around swing space at some point. And um, I remember when I joined the board, President Brunix told me after the stadium opened that he wanted to tear down the office building in front of the stadium because, but that was going to be short term swing space. <laughs> and so there are, there are a series of these uh, quote off campus uh, buildings that we're using uh, for purposes, but I think we do need a plan going forward. I think this is really a strategic location. I think the light rail is a plus. In today's new normal, a developer, an out-of-state developer, would take this building down. Our friend, the wrecking ball, would roll down the street and take this building down. They would also take down the W. Bob building. I mean, there's so much value embedded in the land that they will take down buildings five stories uh, and, and, and lower. And so, um, I think there's an upside, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of upside potential on these locations that we wouldn't have had over on Elm Street um, because of the fact the market wants to go up in the air with, with, uh, with projects. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Regent Anderson, the last word, then I'm going to ask for the vote. Um, just, just sitting here this morning, I, I just want to comment that, you know, we bought real estate, or we're in the process, and we're selling real estate. And I think it, it's just choices. I mean, we, we make these choices every day. Uh, nothing against the Murphy Warehouse, but when I look in my five years here where the university is going, we've pretty much said to the south, east, up University Avenue. Uh, Regent Shue makes a good point about where the Murphy Warehouse is, but there are choices in any businessman has to make. I've made those decisions over 40 years. And we, it's not necessarily right or wrong, they're just choices. Um, I think one thing that, you know, my, my time here is like I say, I see the university going to the south and east and up university. The other interesting thing is if we had a, if we could print our own money, we'd be buying all this property. But that's where the choices come in. And we have had this talk this morning and I haven't heard a thing said about the students. Um, when we decide to buy property, if there's improvements that have to be made, if there's other issues that cost in that, that is money that has to come out of our funds. And it's less money we can put in student services or more money than we have to charge students to come in tuition. So I just think, Today's discussion's been good. There's not a right, there's not a wrong, but it's about choices, which, which way each of us sees the university going. You know, I make choices today. They may prove 15 years from now to be great choices. They may prove to be bad choices, but you have to make those choices with the best information you have available at the time. And so I just think it's important that we say that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Regent Anderson. I would uh, look to one of my colleagues now. I, I realize that uh, I haven't asked for a motion yet to consider this, but uh, I'm, I'm a little sloppy today procedurally. Is there such a motion? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. We've had the discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. That was an affirmative. We note from Regent Mehron, I think. Yes, and I, I said aye. Excellent. I called the negative so fast. I think you're, you're, you came through as a negative, but it was an affirmative. All right, um, moving on here, and uh, we are really at the ragged edge of time as the assembled masses await the start of the actual board meeting. So let's bring the collective bargaining agreements before us at this point. I believe uh, Senior Vice President Burnett is going to walk us through those, and, uh, and then for planning purposes, we will not take up the annual operating budget framework today. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the <clears throat> committee. Uh, today we bring before you two labor agreements for your approval. Um, the first one is the Teamsters Local 320 contract for service, maintenance, and our labor units. It's uh, the agreement um, covers 1,448 employees engaged in building and grounds, maintenance, mechanic, and food service across our campuses, research, and outreach locations. Um, it's the same terms as our AFSME contracts that the board approved last month. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would ha happy to answer any questions, but it, it's within our budget planning parameters, and we would ask your approval. Very good. Could I uh, get a motion from a committee member? So moved. For approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the uh, the local 196 contract for law enforcement. Oh, oh, just I. So we did Teamsters first. Yes. All right. Sorry. This is the the motion then and the second are to approve the Teamsters local 320 contract. Discussion on the Teamsters contract. Seeing none. Let's take the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Very good. That carries as well. And uh, now walk us through the uh, outline of the labor enforcement, the law enforcement labor services contract. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. The second agreement is the agreement between our, the university and our law enforcement labor services, Local 196. This covers uh, sergeants and patrol officers on Twin Cities, Duluth, and Morris campuses. It's about 60 employees across the university. Again, it fits within our budget parameters. And I uh, would like to take this note to thank all of our staff in Office of Human Resources and in Office of Human Services or University Services. This would be the final contract in all of our labor contracts will be set for the entire university if you adopt this one. Thank you. Very good. Is there a committee motion to approve this? A second. I heard both. Second. Further discussion on the 190, local 196 contract? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're getting better at this, Regent Mayor on, so. I, I'm learning. I'm learning. Well, it's me. It's your chair that needs learning, not you. So uh, <laughs> Senior Vice President Burnett, the consent report, and then we will, uh, we will close the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the consent report's fairly light for this committee. Um, we don't have any general contingency. We have one purchase of goods and services and one capital budget amendment for Gopher Athletics. Happy to take any questions that the members may have in the interest of time. Questions on items in the consent report? Regent Shu. Uh, I have a question on the, uh, what is it called, the Larson, Larson Football Performance Center. And that question is, um, I don't really know much about this, um, but it's only, it appears to only be for football. And I'm just wondering if, um, how many people it actually supports. Uh, will support the entire team, or is it just a kind of a smaller version of something that they actually want for the long term? Good question, Regent Shu, SVP Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regent Shu, um, even though the head football coach raised the money for this and it will be in the football facility, the agreement with uh, Athletic Director Coyle is that all student athletes, all go for student athletes, will be able okay. to take advantage of this. Um, that was in the intent all along, even though it's got a place to put it over in the football complex. 
Thank you for that. And follow up, Regent so, Chu. So the follow up would be um, that's great news. Uh, that's what I was hoping for, but um, you know, sometimes we say that and we actually don't have enough space to, <laughs> for everyone to use it. And uh, then we have people using it at odd hours and, and that kind of thing. And I was just kind of wondering if, um, you know, how, how feasible is it to actually be able to support all student athletes? Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Regent Hsu, uh, it's my personal observation that uh, they work uh, they work very closely among the teams in bringing in the soccer team to use the football indoor facility, even the marching band, I believe, in the last academic years used it when weather was inclement. So I see a great deal of camaraderie about using facilities across all the Gopher athletic sports, and I don't think that's going to be an issue with this uh, new amenity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'd entertain a motion to approve the revised consent report. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? The consent report carries, and before I gavel the meeting closed, I just want to note that uh, um, Associate Vice President Tonneson, thank you for making the trip up here. I'm sorry we're not going to get to uh, this important conversation, but I do commend the materials in the docket to the full board. It's another you know, we're two months ahead of uh, a discussion about that. There's some very, very good stuff in there, and I'm sure Julie and Brian will entertain uh, your questions about that material anytime you'd like. So with that, we are going to wrap up, and uh, the meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee is adjourned. And let's um, uh, try to reconvene in about 15 minutes, which would be 11 a.m. <laughs>